Good morning, friends. I am the Reverend Dr. Mary Biedren, and this is Virtual Sunday Worship from North Congregational Church in Farmington Hills, Michigan, for Sunday, October the 25th. I'm coming to you via recording, and in a minute I'll explain I just came back from Crossroads Soup Kitchen helping with food prep. We are recorded, so you will not be able to leave comments like you can with a live broadcast, but I hope that you will, at the end, leave some comments. And meanwhile, right now, I invite you to enjoy two pieces of music from our North Church organ, played by Pat Butler, the Fanfare in G by Mary McDonald, and then the Toccata in D minor, a very familiar tune from Johann Sebastian Bach. <laughs> set of pieces and shows off the beauty of the organ of North Congregational Church and something that we can enjoy every day. 
Again, I am the Reverend Dr. Mary Biedren, Senior Minister of North Congregational Church in Farmington Hills, Michigan. And I am coming to you from my home studio with a picture of the church in the background. This, is, this broadcast is being recorded the day before, October 25th. And I have just come from Crossroads Soup Kitchen in Detroit, where uh, several of us from North Church went down to do some advanced preparation tomorrow, or rather Sunday the 25th when you are watching this. A group of people will go down for both the early and the later shift to cook the food, to serve it up, to hand out the hundreds of cookies that have been made by volunteers and sent down to Crossroads to be served. They're not serving the uh, clients in the soup kitchen building itself. So once again, these things will be handed out to them in the parking lot so that everyone can be kept safe. But we have made a somewhat fancier meal than the usual soup and sandwich. And so it's Italian chicken, as you will see. So I thought it would be fun for you to get a glimpse of what's going on down at Crossroads. And so I made a very short video of the work that Sandy Greer and Sarah Lang and I did along with Chef Michael today. Right here, I'm just gonna pan across Crossroads. There's an office. Out there you see the cookies on the table. Sarah Lang, wave hi Sarah. Here's pans and pans and pans of this Italian chicken and Chef Michael who is just getting us all in line and <laughs> giving us our job. And then over here, some more pans of chicken. And then you look out into the main area and that's where they'll be preparing it. It's gonna be contact free. So this time around, the soup pots are not full, but our hearts are full because we're making chicken and good food for lots of people. While we were preparing the food, we had a great conversation with Chef Michael who plans the meals and helps us execute them about what a sacred thing it is to be able to feed hungry people, to offer them what they need in such a direct way. And I thank everyone who either contributed financially or by making cookies or by taking time to go down to Crossroads and uh, prepare and then serve this meal. It is certainly a privilege to take care of God's beloved children. Now I'd like to ask the children to gather around for a children's message. So my question for you today is, what kind of a house do you live in? Do you live in a big house? Does it have a front and back yard? Does it have more than one story? Is there a flight of stairs that you have to go up? Do you have a basement? Um, what kinds of things are in your house? How is your house made pretty and fancy? Maybe you've got some Halloween decorations up right now or have done other things to make your home seem special because it is the place where you live, where things start and end each day, where your family comes together. Now my question is this, what kind of a house do you think God lives in? Now, some people think that the church is the house of God, and certainly we call it the house of God, but it is not the only place that God lives. If you were going to build a house for God, what would you build? Would you make it big and splendid? Would you make it small and cozy? Would it have a lot of rooms or would it be wide open so everyone could see each other? Be kind of fun to think about how you might build a house for God. King David, when he was establishing his kingdom in the city of Jerusalem, wanted to build a house for God that was just as fancy as the house that he lived in. He wanted God to have a temple right there in the middle of the city. But God told David, no. And then God told David something else. God said that where God lives is not in any one place. It's not in a fancy house. It's not even in a tent. It is with people. It is where the people are. And wherever God's people are, God is living there with them. So whenever you need to find God, all you have to do is ask and look inside yourself to discover that God is right there, hearing your prayers, walking alongside you, showing you how to be kind, showing you how to be fair, showing you how to be God's person in this world and invite other to others to discover that God is already with us. So I hope that this day or this coming week, 
you will find some kind of way to do something kind and say, I'm doing this because God lives with me. Right now, we're going to hear that scripture about David wanting to build a house for God, read by our lay reader, Nancy Scott, and it is from 2 Samuel chapter 7. Today's scripture reading is from the second book of Samuel, chapter 7, verses 1 through 12. Now when the king was settled in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut up all your enemies from before you, and I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may live in their own place, and be disturbed no more. And evildoers shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you, Nancy. I'm going to ask you all now the same question that I asked the children. Where does God live? What kind of a house does God live in? It's trickier than you think. Some people think this, North Congregational Church, is a house of God, and indeed it is, but so are many other places. In the book of Exodus, as the slaves came out of Egypt, as they moved through the wilderness, as they went to Sinai and got the law, and received the tablets of the Ten Commandments, God told them to build a place where they could worship God, where they could house the, the commandments and the tabernacle that was a tent, a tent of meeting, a tent where God's people could go to worship God and then fold it up and take it with them. And they wandered for 40 years with that tent of meeting. This tent of meeting lasted for a long time. It lasted through the time of the judges. It lasted all the way up until the ark was finally brought by David into Jerusalem. David, as you heard, lived in a house of the precious wood cedar, and he wanted to make a big, fancy, safe, splendid dwelling for God, certainly nothing less than what he as the king would have, and so he imagined and God drew up plans to build a temple that would look like this, pretty big. It later got built by his son Solomon, but David wanted God to have this safe place to live, a place for God to be. God sent a message from the prophet Nathan and said to David, no, you don't. You are not going to build me a house to live in. God said, I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt, but I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle, which you saw a picture of. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? In other words, I didn't ask for a house. Why are you giving me a house? Now, I am mindful that we, the followers of Jesus, and as well as the people of the book, the Jews, and also the Muslims, have built big houses for God. 
big places where we may worship, places where we can have a fancy pipe organ to hear music, places where we can gather and sing and do those things. Big churches, really big churches, cathedrals. And in the process, a lot of congregations have discovered the same struggle that God warned David about. Are we trying to contain God? Are we trying to claim God? Are we trying to limit God to where we want God to be? Are we trying to make the terms for God to be among us? This has always been a tension for God's people, always, as they have settled down, as they have moved around, as they have, as they have been uprooted, as in the exile. And sometimes the idea about having a house for God, having a place for God, has divided us terribly. <clears throat> the word of God that came to Nathan to give to David made it clear, however, that the place that God belongs is not in a house that we make for him. God said, I, made a, I will make a place for my people. You will have this land that I'm sending you to and giving, you to, giving to you. But more than that, I will make my own house and it will not be a physical place. It will be in the hearts and lives of my people. And David, you will be a house. You will be a dynasty. And from that dynasty, great good will come upon the world. And we, of course, know, as we will celebrate in Christmas, that Jesus was of the house and lineage of David and was born just outside the city of David in Bethlehem. Now, what would it mean if we saw this house that Jesus referred to, this house that is referred to over and over again in the Bible as a place for worship, as not just the temple, but also the hearts of the people? What would it mean then when Jesus says, my house is a house of prayer? What would it mean when we said a house divided against itself cannot stand? What would it mean to hear Jesus saying, in my father's house are many rooms, are many mansions, are many places for people to be? The house that was ultimately built for God, the Temple of Solomon, which I showed you a picture of, was magnificent. It was impressive. It was made of cedar covered with gold. And also, if we are honest, if you follow down the books of Kings and Chronicles, you will discover that the temple was very limiting for the people. It could not be moved around like the tents and the tabernacle. Instead, rules were developed, rules about how people had to be and who people had to be to come into that place. Some were disqualified for entry, told they weren't pure enough, told they were not part of the family of Israel and not, did not deserve to come into the presence of God. Some people were told they couldn't come in because they couldn't pay the temple tax. They couldn't pay to keep it up. They weren't dressed right. They weren't part of the chosen people who were called to meet within. You can see where this ends up every time, not just in the kingdom of Israel, but also all the way through to our times. One of the criticisms that Jesus, who was God incarnate, God made human living among us, that criticism of people or the, that people made of him was that he was not obedient to the rules of the temple. He did things that you should have done in the temple outside of the temple, and he didn't do things in the temple that they expected him to. Jesus made the point that the temple is not God. The temple is not the thing you worship. That was a goal of the early congregationalists when they envisioned a very simple sanctuary, a place with glass windows, not stained glass, a place that allowed God to be the main attraction, not the fanciness or the special requirements of the place. Jesus taught us that wherever two or three are gathered together in his name, God is there. Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit, the advocate, just God dwelling in our hearts, would come not to the most pure or the most chosen ones, not to those who earned it by piety, not those who gave the most money, but would come to everyone, to all people, before we were ever good, not because we deserved it, but because God loves us. Now, what difference might it make for us as God's people if we recognize that God dwells in us and among us, not out there, not up there, not in any one particular dedicated space? It's not wrong to have a place dedicated for doing ministry. Even the Puritans who founded Congregationalism as a protest against the cathedrals and the structure of the Church of England 
established meeting houses, places where they could come together, come away from the world, sanctuaries where it was easier to be quiet, to pray, to think about God. But the goal of that place was never and is not ever to hold holiness in. It is to prepare the people who come to go out into the world in God's name, to carry the good news of God's love and grace to everyone, whether that good news is a, a prophecy, whether that good news is talk about God, whether that good news is cookies that are made to hand out to the poor and hygiene products collected to give out to people who are living on the streets. All of these things are ways that we may show God's love and grace into the world. Now, in a time like ours, when we are living apart, not by choice, but because we are concerned about safety, this whole idea of where God is and where we manifest God is much on my mind. Like everyone, I wish we could be back in the building all together, singing and praying out loud and hugging and socializing. But right now, I am acutely aware that this is not safe. The pandemic is continuing to rage on and cases are growing here in Michigan as they are in many places this final week in October. And so we are working instead to be separate, to work from our homes, to work outdoors, to go and do ministries of care for the world, feeding and building and consoling. And I am mindful that there are also North Church volunteers today at Camp Restore working to create living space for people to come help rebuild the city. This work is God's work, and it can be done anywhere. It can be done at any time. We are working to create through these broadcasts and in other ways virtual space so that we may come together and worship and remind ourselves and each other that God is alive and at work in the world. God is alive and at work in our spirits, and there are so many ways that we can call upon God and discover that God is among us. Perhaps the most clear expression of this idea that God is already among us is in the closing passages of the Revelation to John, in the apocalyptic vision where creation has been unmade, the world destroyed, and then remade into the world as God has always intended it. Let this be your watchword for this week as we come together across distance, across differences, and as we remember the lesson that these times have has given us, that the thing that is most precious and most missed is the gathering and the sharing. The thing that is most precious of all is the people. People that we meet, the people that we know, the people that we serve, the people that we love, the people where God dwells among us. Listen to the words of John the Evangelist from the Revelation chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. And behold, I heard the voice from the throne saying, See, I am making all things new. My friends, may God make you anew each day. May you be a temple, a sanctuary, a dwelling place most fit for the Spirit of God and most fit for the Spirit of God to transform. May that indwelling of God's Spirit move you out into the world to love and to serve in God's name. As we think about David, as we think about what it is to dwell in the house of the Lord and have that house of the Lord be our lives, let's hear our North Church soloist Jim Wilking singing Psalm 23, a Psalm of David.
He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley, of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell. Thank you, Jim, for that beautiful music and for all of the ways that you celebrate God's presence amongst us. Now we are going to join together to lift up God living within us, following in the path of God living as one of us, to reach out to the God who lives and reigns forever by lifting our hearts up in prayer. O oh, gracious God, as we recall that we are your house, that your sacred dear presence is here with us, we are awed, we are humbled, and we wonder how we can find what we need to live up to that wonderful charge that you have. Remind us again, O oh Lord, that we can always return to you for filling up, for rest and relaxation, for comfort, that it is you who will lead us through the green pastures and beside the still waters, that it is you that will be a light in the darkness, that it is you who will remind us that there is life even beyond the finality of death. And so in trust, we pray to you, our beloved creator. Oh God, we pray for our world. We pray for all the places where there is dissent and division. This is a struggle your people have always had, O oh God. It is so hard for us to look past our differences to see our many similarities. And so, O oh God, we pray that you will help peace to come over all the earth. Peace among nations, peace within nations, 
peace within communities, peace within families, peace within all of our hearts. Help us as followers of Jesus to do works of peace, remembering that we named him the Prince of Peace. Remind us that we are all one in your love. And so therefore, as we care for one another, we are caring in some sense for you. We pray this day for the sick, for those sickened by the pandemic disease raging among us, for those who are sick from other things. We pray for those who have become ill and are seeking cures, for those who have undergone procedures, for those who are seeking healing, for those who are awaiting answers from tests, for those who are caring for people they love, for those who have rounded the corner into death, and most especially today for those who mourn deaths most recent and also long ago. O oh God, you have always been our help and our hope. Remind us that you have given us the ability to care for the sick, to care about the sick, to nurture and to nurse, and show us the ways we may do that. We pray for those whom Jesus entrusted to us, the poor, the hungry, the homeless, the helpless. O oh God, as we make food for crossroads, as we build dwellings for Camp Restore, as we undertake missions that will help people live better lives in our community and around our world, show us the ways that we may keep expanding our ministries. Show us the many ways that we may care for the poor, not as a task, but instead as a privilege, as an honor to entertain you, just as we entertain and serve those hungry people among us. It is sacred work, O oh God, let us never forget it. And let us never look down upon those who have less than we have, because in your eyes, we are all equal. And it may be that there is much we have to learn from those who have nothing left but you to rely upon. O oh God, we pray for your church, for the people of faith all around the world who are calling upon you in the name of Jesus and in other names, especially for this community of faith and North Congregational Church, for the sister churches in the congregational way, as we remember that 400 years ago, our path was established in this continent. We also pray for all your people who come together to worship and then go forth to serve, that they may remain true to your calling, to your ministry, to your mission. Oh God, lift up your church, help us to reach people even in this time of pandemic. Send your blessings upon all who hear these prayers, who watch these broadcasts, who find so many ways to connect with you, not as a giver of judgment and a giver of punishment, but instead as one who extends grace and reconciliation and compassion to all of your beloved children. We also pray for ourselves, O oh God, that we may be strong, that we may see that you are our shepherd, that we may understand what your calling asks of us, that we may recall and live up to the role that we have as your home in this earth, as we seek to move through this life and into the home where all your people gather in peace beyond death. Oh God, sometimes the promises seem almost too good to be true, and yet we know they are true because of Jesus who lived and died and rose again and taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in tempt into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I wish God's blessings upon all of you, Know that you can go to our website, northcongregationalchurch.org, to find ways to serve, to see pictures from Crossroads once they're posted, and also to learn how you can help to support the ministries that we undertake in God's name on behalf of the world. Right now, we're going to hear three pieces of music from the North Church organ, and I will be back at the end with a benediction. And so please enjoy. A Fugue on Our God, Our Help in Ages, Ages Past, arranged by Hal Hobson, an arrangement by James Pethel of What a Friend We Have in Jesus, that popular hymn, and then 
an arrangement of the hymn, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus, all played by Patricia Butler.
Thank you to everyone who helped make this time of worship happen. To Pat, our organist, to Jim, our soloist, to Nancy, our lay reader, to the people who have gone down to work at Crossroads and prepare and serve food to the hungry, to the people who have gone down to Camp Restore to help to build shelter to those who help to restore dignity and life to those in great need and in places of great economic distress. Thank you to all of you for coming and joining us in this time. I hope you will share some comments at the end of this broadcast in the comments section. And I also hope that we'll see you Wednesdays at 3 o'clock, Sundays at 1030 in the morning. And we are always available to watch on Facebook, North Congregational Church page, and also on the northcongregationalchurch.org website. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Amen.